Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the compliment of your invitation and for the courtesy of your attention. I would notice that our chairman today said if you're not happy with anything at the conference, you've got to talk to another copper. So I hope I'm not going to give you a cause for that. This is my ninth year as Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary. I leave, unless they do a crest on me, in six and a half months, and it's been quite a journey, and I'll have a couple of remarks to make at the end uh, about uh, just what a smooth journey it's been. But today, I'm going to cover uh, some themes, such as our country's criminal justice system, which is creaking, the plight of the most vulnerable in society. I'm going to talk about the importance and the success of force management statements in securing improvements in the stewardship of police assets and, of course, the way in which chief constables are aware of and deal with the welfare, mental and physical welfare, of police officers. And I'm very aware that the superintending ranks have suffered disproportionate cuts in their ranks and are not yet adequately reflected in the uplift program that is uh, now underway. I'm also going to talk about the value of a network code. You've heard me about this uh, before, uh, to help the 43 forces of England and Wales and some other bodies to work together in more collaborative ways, to rub out the black lines on the map which divides police areas without going through the agony of reorganization and the agony of local government finance uh, discontinuities uh, and so on. That is something that the efficient and effective uh, policing in the 21st century des desperately needs. Uh, but before I do any of that, I'd like to offer some reflection on some other events since I last addressed the Superintendents Association annual conference uh, in September 2019. And apart from the pandemic year, this is my 10th, or is it the 11th, 10th uh, time that I've uh, addressed the Superintendents Association conference and almost certainly the last. Uh, when I did that, uh, the prospect of an impending global health crisis it was, of course, nowhere to be seen. Uh, but the pandemic and the emergence of its variant strains uh, have had a major effect on our personal lives and our professional lives since then. And the measures brought in to curb the spread of the virus, particularly restrictions on liberty and economic activity, have had a profound and far-reaching effect on the public and uh, of which you, your members and the officers they lead uh, have been acutely aware. And it's not over yet. Uh, many people suffered the loss of family members, friends, neighbors, and colleagues. The police were no exception. At least 30 police officers and staff in England and Wales lost their lives to COVID. And on behalf of everyone who works in the inspectorate, I offer my most profound condolences to those who have lost loved ones. The pandemic has taken its toll on many other people because of intensified loneliness and isolation. It has deeply affected people's mental health, as well as their economic and educational well-being and prospects. Some people continue to suffer the long-term debilitating effects of the virus, and they don't know when, if ever, they will get better. The public found it difficult to distinguish between the law and government guidance during the pandemic. Information from different sources was contradictory, and many people were left confused about what they were allowed to do and what they were not allowed to do. The frequent the changing uh, content and nature of the regulations made it extremely difficult for both the public and the police to keep up. The first set of regulations covered 11 pages. The last set of regulations ca covered 123. In the light of this, the policing of the pandemic, in particular the policing of restrictions on movement, brought into very sharp focus the responsibilities and obligations of the public, the police, and the government Primarily, as you all know, it is the responsibility of the police to enforce the law, to enforce the regulations which are the law. 
And in theory, at least, that should be a relatively straightforward matter. The first set of regulations were not complicated. You could leave your home if you had a reasonable excuse, and there was a non-exhaustive list of 13 reasonable excuses. But the new regulations were, were accompanied by a considerable number of government-issued guidance, which had no legal effect. Put simply, citizens were not under any obligation to do anything other than what the law said. And when the government published regulations and guidance, it didn't always make this important distinction sufficiently clear, neither to the police nor to the public. Now, emphatically, again, I say, the police's role is not to enforce government guidance if it goes beyond the terms of the law. That is what they do, the law. And in the United Kingdom, unlike very much of the rest of the world, the police are not the obedient and coercive arm of the executive government. Let's not lose sight of the police's wider response to the pandemic. It was, in many respects, exemplary. For the dedication of duty shown by so many officers, for forces flexibility and willingness to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances, and to the national coordination provided by Operation Tala, for the police's collective contribution to keeping us all safe, I offer my thanks, my warmest congratulations, and very great praise. Very little went wrong. I'd like to turn now to the state of policing in general, and I'd like to begin by making an observation about culture in policing, uh, with which there is a very obvious link to some of the comments I've just made. The culture of the police has many very great strengths. It's a culture of determination, of courage, hard work, and achievement, of facing any challenge or danger and confronting it in full measure. There is a considerable degree of goodwill in the police in making sacrifices, personal and otherwise, to protect the public, to deter crime, disrupt criminal networks, apprehend criminals, and make communities safer. Nothing should be done which could prejudice that. And with that culture comes officers' ready acceptance of risk. All police officers, whether full-time, part-time, special constables, as well as police community support officers, police staff, and some other volunteers, all of them face risk every time they come to work. For many of them and their families, living with the risk is a way of life, an unavoidable and accepted part of the job of keeping other people safe. But it's not just their risk to their physical health. Many police officers are at risk of suffering from mental ill health. They do not, sorry, not only do they come under great stresses in the exercise of their duties, but they also face the most appalling and dreadful things. In many respects, policing is a dangerous job, and it is incumbent upon all of us to be mindful of that and to do what we can to help those who help us. Police superintendents have an extraordinarily important role to play in ensuring that officers and staff are properly cared for at work. And police leaders above those ranks have an, a, a very onerous obligation to ensure that the stresses on you, the superintending ranks, you who bear a very considerable span of responsibility and stress, that you are properly cared for too. Lockdown intensified and increased the vulnerability of people who were already vulnerable. During the first lockdown period, the National Domestic Abuse Helpline logged 65% more contacts and calls compared to the previous three months. There was also a noticeable increase in domestic abuse-related demand for victim support services in the weeks following the easing of lockdown. This figure may not reveal the true extent of what was happening behind closed doors. Children living with domestic abuse in some form or another will bear scars often for life. Even if they were not physically harmed, it is highly likely that they will have been psychologically harmed just by being there. Many children will be profoundly affected by the fact that they witnessed and heard 
domestic abuse at home, or they hid from it and knew that it was going on. And that feeds into crime. It must be never be overlooked that children who grow up in poverty and suffer severe neglect have a much higher chance of becoming offenders in future. A very high proportion of people in prison were, in one way or another, victims of domestic abuse when they were children. Many of the people who end up in prison or who are drawn into, criminal, into the criminal justice system are people who are ill and not bad. They've done bad things. They may have harmed, alarmed, or threatened other people. But in a high proportion of cases, what these people have been through in their lives, very often as either victims or witnesses to domestic abuse, has made a material contribution to how they turned out. If we are to break the cycle of offending, we need to have a sound rehabilitation system in place. In many cases, people commit offenses because they have no money, no job, no stable accommodation, no food, and they're often dependent on alcohol or drugs. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, of course. But in too many respects, the promises of rehabilitation are not kept. Many people walk out of prison with 46 pounds in their pocket, a bag containing their possessions, nowhere to live, no adequate preparation for life outside. Very often they simply go back to the environment and the associations and the incentives which sent them to prison in the first place. The crisis in criminal justice has gone on for far too long. And so has the crisis in adult and child mental health provision. Many people who have mental ill health as adults began that journey into ill health when they were children. And to make matters worse, in an intolerably high number of cases, children and young people have difficulties gaining adequate access to NHS treatment for mental ill health. As every superintendent is acutely aware, Unless the health and social care system is fixed and people can get the support they need from it when they need it, then people will continue to be vulnerable. That may lead them unavoidably and unnecessarily into the criminal justice system and severe crisis in their personal lives from which they will never fully recover. The perilous state of the criminal justice system has been widely criticized for many years, and the court backlog is a significant problem. In recent years, there has been a vast reduction in the number of cases brought to justice. In fact, the actual number of cases going into the criminal justice system is at the lowest level it has been for many years. Yet, for some reason, Court backlogs and waiting times have become inexcusably long. Why, at Snaresbrook Crown Court, when they have 20 operational courts, are only two of them in operation on particular days? In many cases, this unacceptable delay in taking cases to court will take its toll on the physical and mental health of victims and witnesses and those who are accused. Often, these people are vulnerable. Victims may lose confidence in the criminal justice system. They may decide they are no longer willing to wait and to support a prosecution. People suspected of having committed offenses who are on remand will have to spend longer in prison. All communities depend upon and deserve justice. Justice delayed is not justice. It is justice denied. Those accused of offences should have easy access to legal representation through all stages of the criminal justice system. However, the financing of criminal defence is in a terrible state. The Law Society has warned that with no adequate funding in place, criminal defence services may become unavailable in some areas. In my State of Policing report a couple of years ago, I described the criminal justice system as dysfunctional and defective. By the time of my 2019 assessment, after that, little improvement had been made. And a year has passed since then. 
and there hasn't been a great deal of change. The proposed Royal Commission on Criminal Justice, which was announced in the 2019 General Election Manifesto of the Government, still has not been established. And despite, despite repeated requests to the Government, no indication has been given as to when that Commission will start work. As superintendents know, the government's 20,000 officer uplift program, which was announced in 2019, continues to make good progress. It's even ahead of its target. The program is designed, as you know, to recruit an additional 20,000 police officers in England and Wales by 31st March 2023, and that would broadly return officer numbers to 2010 levels. Now, while that program is undoubtedly a good thing, there is a significant pressure on forces to recruit the additional officers in time, as the 20,000 extra will be on top of the recruitment to replace the approximately 7,000 officers who leave the service every year, mostly through retirement. It's also important that the numbers of specialists in forces and the National Crime Agency are maintained and, where necessary, increased to meet future demand. And as I mentioned at the beginning, and therefore, the span of responsibility and of risk carried by superintendents is enlarged and therefore the case for the superintending ranks to be proportionately increased is unanswerable. Taking those factors into account, the service needs to recruit and train over 50,000 people over that three-year period. Now, they're ahead of target already and that's good, but that does, of course, increase the proportion of relatively inexperienced and young in service officers in the service. And therefore, they need more supervision, guidance, support, and all the rest. And recruitment carries risks. Police officers are vested with unique powers to detain people, to search them, to take away their property, and to take away their liberty, temporarily, at their own discretion. The service has a great responsibility to do all it reasonably can to ensure that its new officers are fit to hold those powers. And the quality of vetting needs to be consistently high. Police legitimacy is also closely linked to how officers use their powers, such as the power to stop and search and their use of force. This year, we reported on the disproportionate use of force and stop and search powers and the negative effect this can have on some my ethnic minority communities. I'm pleased to see, however, that many forces are working with their ethnic minority communities to encourage applications and to support applicants who want to join the police service. Annual funding settlements are the norm for the police. They're the norm for many, many public services. But such short-term settlements are incompatible with efficient and effective long-term planning. That is why, and some of you will know I used to be the economic regulator for the railways 20 years ago, that is why in the economically regulated industries, five-year financial settlements became the norm because long-term planning, capital investment, requires consistency and stability and predictability and certainty, not annual funding settlements. The British Railways Board didn't know sometimes until three months into their financial year what their capital expenditure program could be. You can't maintain long-term assets on that kind of short-term basis. That's why the economic regulators, one of the re reasons why the economic regulators were given the authority to establish five-year settlements. Five-year settlements that could not be disturbed by short-term political horizons. The same applies to the most safety-critical, essential public service of all, because without policing, nothing works. If society cannot uh, maintain law and order and resolve disputes peacefully, then the economy will break down. Civil society will suffer severely. So when it comes to funding, forces and regional organized crime units need certainty and stability and predictability just the same. So there is a clear need for multi-year financial settlements. For example, technologies such as body-worn video or fully functional 
handheld mobile devices or facial recognition systems, and of course artificial intelligence and machine learning, something that is massively underused in policing, and the connected systems and the infrastructure to support them are all things which the police forces must invest in for the long term. The integration of police systems with other parts of the criminal justice system also needs long-term investment. Lack of integration currently makes it harder for the police quickly to pass vital evidence, such as camera footage, to the CPS. This and other problems with the system can result in delays, causing victims and witnesses to become disillusioned and withdraw from proceedings, and all sorts of other injustices to take place. The forces which we and the inspectorate judge as being efficient have provided evidence that they use public money appropriately. So they should, if they have that determination by the inspectorate, benefit from multi-year financial settlements now. There are lessons to be learned from other essential public services, even if those provided by the private sector as well. The service can and should adopt techniques and instruments used outside policing to increase effectiveness and efficiency and improve public safety. Every well-managed enterprise needs a sound understanding of three things. The demand that it faces in the years to come, insofar as it can be determined, the state of the assets which it will use to meet that demand, and in policing that's predominantly people, and how much money it will need using those assets efficiently to meet that demand. In the economically regulated industries which deal with safety critical, monopoly, asset intensive, essential public services, these instruments which assure the public, the regulators, we're not regulators but we do similar things, that things are going to be done correctly, efficiently, economically, and in a sound and sustainable way. They're known as network management statements. And since policing, as I've mentioned, is probably the most essential safety critical public service of all, we have introduced those and we've called them force management statements. They're modeled on their regulatory equivalents. There are many differences, of course. They are much harder to do than any of the network management statements for gas, water, electricity, telecommunications, postal services, and other essential services, but they have to be done. And they are already making material uh, improvements to the quality of policing. After doing his first force management statement, a senior officer in one of the Yorkshire forces, I won't say which one, said to one of my staff, and he used the, um, the metaphor of alligators swimming around. He said, before I did my first FMS, I thought the alligators were swimming around my ankles. After I'd done it, I realized they were swimming around my waist. It is essential that the leadership in police forces have that sound understanding of demand, asset stewardship, what it takes to look after those assets and to ensure their efficiency and economic operation to the highest practicable level and the money they need in order to meet that demand. I've spoken, my final subject is this. I've spoken many times about the 43 force policing model in England and Wales and the problems that it presents for many aspects of policing, including in the flow of information and intelligence between forces and the establishment and efficient operation of national ICT systems. There is an urgent need for more effective collaboration and cooperation between police forces and between forces and other law enforcement agencies and in due course between the police law enforcement agencies and other public services who are concerned with the prevention of crime and dealing with its consequences. This year you will see for consultation a network code to enable the police service to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness in these respects, dissolving the barriers to efficient cross-force operations. In other national systems, the interoperability and uniformity of standards and operation are achieved through a regulatory system and instruments similar to a network code. The network code which I will provide, but it is not within my power to require it, it is in the power of the Home Office, 
will be a multilateral contract, a legally binding collaboration agreement entered into by all chief constables and their London equivalents, all PCCs and their equivalents, the National Crime Agency, the BTP, the relevant uh, police authority, the Civil Nuclear Constabulary, the College of Policing, and the Home Secretary. Now, I can't require this, but I hope that the force of rationality uh, will persuade. Other participants in law enforcement, such as Police Scotland and PSNI, could join later. All parties could enter the code voluntarily, and this would indeed be preferable. But as I've said, the Home Secretary has reserved powers. It would be an enduring contract. Nobody would have the right to withdraw. The initial conception for the network code for law enforcement was that it would apply only to police ICT, the specification and procurement of police ICT. And indeed, that is the most urgent, to ensure that over time there would be complete interoperability of ICT systems. But the code can and should go further. The code would allow for the creation of a process that assesses proposals for single system operation, either on a regional or national basis, or both, which would be achieved by a system of qualified majority voting. It would pool the individual sovereignties of the forces and the PCCs in question. And in a particular case, a force and its PCC could find itself outvoted in a minority. Now, there would be different thresholds of votes depending on the nature of the proposal. Some votes may require to be passed by 55%, 65%, 85%. It's up to the police service to figure out what those thresholds should be and how they should apply. But the freedoms, having pulled their sovereignty, the freedoms that the forces and the PCCs and others will have given up will be far less valuable than what they gain through a more consistent and stable and efficient and effective policing, a set of policing decisions. Before getting to the stage of being put to a vote, the proposals would have to be thoroughly evaluated, of course, to ensure they're sound and viable and affordable and otherwise satisfactory. The College of Policing should have a leading role in this since it sets standards and other experts may be required to be engaged according to necessity. Now, I've put forward the idea of a voting system that reflects the relative sizes of the forces, but to the same time uh, affords to small forces appropriate minority protections to ensure they're not always outvoted by the largest forces. Since the Home Secretary has overall political responsibility for law enforcement and the Treasury controls the money, it will be necessary for the Home Secretary to hold a special or golden vote. It need not be cast in every case. It may never be cast. It could be a reserve power to be used only when the Home Secretary considers it's necessary, either to push something through or to stop something. In many respects, policing is very far from simple, and the network code will offer an opportunity to cut through complexity that has plagued the service since 1964. In conclusion, what I want to say is my assessment of the criminal justice system shows how essential it is that the public services in question work well together. The intensity of the independence, the interdependence of policing, education, housing, and health and social care has to be fully recognized. We cannot, of course, and uh, one could never contemplate this, separate policing from the rest of the criminal justice system. But it's not a single system. It's four parts in a system, policing, prosecution, prisons, probation, and then there's a bit in the middle called the judiciary which do not adequately operate as a single system. That must change. And the other public services which rely on the effectiveness and efficiency of policing must also be as efficient and effective as possible. That is what I wanted to say in relation to the state of the criminal justice system and the role of policing. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is uh, my last uh, Police Superintendent Association of England Wales conference as the Chief Inspector of Constabulary. And in my time in public office, uh, and in the pay review I did before that, many unkind things have been said about me. Hundreds of thousands of them. And I'm just going to mention a couple. The pay review, which I did immediately before this job, which did not 
do pensions, it did many other things, but it didn't do pensions, was, as you may remember, very controversial. And from the safety of anonymity of social media, one individual condemned me as an evil scum Tory pension thief. And when my wife heard that, she said, how dare they call you a Tory? <laughs> but there's better. In 2005, the late Robin Cook MP once described me as the most unreasonable and stubborn man he had ever met. Now, given that in his time as Foreign Secretary, he dealt with the likes of Mugabe and Gaddafi, <laughs> I thought that was putting it a bit strong. However, I hope that over the last nine years, the inspectorate's line of proportionate, evidence-based, and rational reports will have gone some way to restore my reputation. But that is for others to judge. Thank you. I've gone on too long. So I've gone one minute and nine seconds over. You have, Sir Thomas. But, and, um, but if there's flexibility, I'm happy to take questions, but otherwise I'll yeah. get off. But we have got some questions, and I hope you don't mind. We're going to ask you a couple of them, please, oh, no, because that's fine. That's they're fine. very popular. Um, um, we are going to start with uh, that report, actually, um, because the question is quite simply, uh, you were the architect of the report that led to police pay being governed by the PRRB. Do you think the process is fair and delivering fair outcomes for the police? I think it is fair um, because the police negotiating board which preceded the police remuneration review body um, uh, was uh, in many respects paralyzed uh, by the highly sophisticated and effective techniques of the police federation. And the result was that um, it became extremely difficult in many, many cases to reach a, a, an adequate settlement. And it took a long, long time. It is a disappointment that having established the PRRB, which is supposed to and does receive evidence from all sides and make its own determination, a bit like an arbitral tribunal, that it hasn't operated like that in all respects. And instead, the staff side and the uh, and the officer's side uh, have engaged, as I understand it, in backroom deals so that they can present a, uh, an agreed or substantially agreed position to the PRRB, which the PRRB is then asked to rubber stamp. That's the police negotiating board resurrected from the grave. Somebody should put a stake through the heart of that and put it back on the proper basis Legislation was introduced to establish the PRRB. Police, rev uh, sorry, pay review bodies do work well in other sectors. It should not be deflected and disabled by, um, by such techniques. I'm very disappointed that if those practices are continuing, that uh, the PRRB's uh, functioning is being uh, jeopardized. Okay. Do you mind if I just put that same question to the delegates? I just want to know what the delegates think. Do you believe that those processes are indeed fair and delivering fair outcome for the police? Can we just have a show of hands, please? No. No. In the end of the day, the Home Secretary has to make a decision as to whether or not the determinations are acceptable because she holds the purse strings. And um, I am aware that um, the limitations on police pay, which are substantially a function of the decisions of the Treasury, have been very, very disagreeable to police officers who have been um, uh, on pay freezes for a very long time. And she's not here today. So I understand. <laughs> OK. All right, um, just one other question because then we will let you go. Another very, very uh, popular choice. Um, what are your views on the system for senior police appointments? Are we getting the best chief constables when, es when in essence they are political appointees? Well, I don't think they're political appointees. They're appointed by politicians. But then that was true uh, with police authorities. I mean, somebody's got to appoint the chief. Um, 
the PCC model was really good on paper. It hasn't worked as well as it ought to have worked, and that's largely a function of the people. Some PCCs have been um, exemplary, very effective. You know, they've, they've, they've shown the model can work. Others, and we can name them, but I won't. Um, so, and you know, some of them didn't get re-elected or didn't stand for re-election. Um, uh, were um, were uh, very serious disappointments. Um, I think that uh, before the Police Reform Social Responsibility Act 2011, which created the PCCs, the inspectors of constabulary were a formal part of the appointment process. Parliament took us out of the appointment process for Home Office forces, not for the Chief Constable of the British Transport Police or um, the DG of the National Crime Agency and so on, but took us out of that. And uh, very frequently, uh, my regional HMIs have been asked by PCCs, please come and help us. We have a range of candidates. We would like your opinion on them. And we are not allowed to answer. We're the only people who are not allowed to answer. And yet, it is highly likely that we will have seen over the years those candidates for chief, of, chief constable posts, I'm talking about chief constable posts, when they were superintendents, ACCs and DEPs and maybe chief constables and smaller forces. We know a lot about these people and yet we're the one class of people in the whole country who are not allowed to express an opinion. I have asked the four home secretaries and the six permanent secretaries that have been in office in, in my time Will you please change the law? Don't put us back into the senior appointments panel and the whole mechanism. Just give us a one-line legislative authorization that if a PCC asks us for our opinion, we are entitled to answer. This gagging of the inspectors of constabulary in relation to one of the most important decisions a PCC will ever make is unsustainable. Okay. Now I am being told to uh, stop because we are nearly eight minutes over. Sir Thomas Windsor, thank you very much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a round of applause. Thank you very much.